It was, uh, it was quite a journey. I was in LA, uh, God, I don't know, what's today? Saturday. I was in LA Friday morning after the release of my new book, um, which we have here, which I'll tell you about, and um, en route here, and it's taken about 24 hours and some stranded uh, experiences, and we kind of had to move heaven and earth to get here. And what was really interesting for me was I was feeling stressed out, thinking, oh my God, I'm going to give a talk. I, might, I, I almost didn't make it multiple times. I might not make it. And then I noticed that it wasn't just that I was frustrated that I might not make it to the talk. I was feeling sad that I might not make it to Farm Sanctuary. And it was, I mean, Farm Sanctuary, as you know, it's an amazing, it's a wonderful, beautiful place. And I was thinking about, you know, what makes it so special that I'm, you know, I'm traveling here from Germany, I'm living in Germany now, from Germany to LA and coming out to Watkins Glen. What is so special about it that would make me devastated if I didn't come this weekend? And of course, we know the animals are a special, beautiful part, but it actually, a lot of it for me is also the people. And it's the amazing staff who I've worked with who I absolutely love, who are some of the hardest working people I've ever seen. And it's the people who are attracted to this environment and this energy. This is a room full of people who express a level of compassion and a commitment to peace that is virtually unparalleled. And that is amazing. So thank you all um, for being you. So, by some miracle, I made it, and here I am to talk about sustainable activism. For those of you who aren't, don't consider yourselves activists, because consider this sustainable veganism, and for those of you who aren't yet fully vegan, you can just consider this sustainable living as somebody who's moving toward veganism in a dominant non-vegan culture. Now, before I get started, I have a question for you. I'm curious to, to see how many people here have either experienced this yourself or you know someone who's suffered from burnout due to their activism or due to being vegan. Okay, that's a lot of people in the room. How about somebody who's like been heading towards burnout? Yes, okay, so this is, um, in my experience, I have been in 39 countries around the world now. I, I travel professionally through our Center for Effective Vegan Advocacy, um, training advocates and how to raise awareness about uh, veganism. And I've seen everywhere in the world without fail that this is an epidemic issue among vegans and even vegetarians, this feeling of uh, moving towards burnout. So. I'm going to talk about what I refer to as sustainable activism, but first I want to do, give you some definitions. I define sustainability as being when our intake is greater than or equal to our output, physically, emotionally, and socially. So this means basically what you take into your life is more than or equal to what you put out of your life. Kind of imagine yourself as having like an energetic bank account. Just like a regular bank account, if you constantly take out of it without replenishing it, what happens? We go bankrupt. There are many people who are trying to create a better world for animals who are becoming more and more internally bankrupt because they're giving to the world without giving to themselves. Have you seen this? Just a little bit. So sustainable activism is when our resilience is greater than or equal to the stress that we experience. Now, resilience is the ability to withstand and bounce back from stress. You know, like think of yourself as having a psycho-emotional immune system. Just like your physical immune system, you need to keep it stronger than the germ that threatens it or you get sick. So what we need to do to have sustainable lives as activists, as vegans, is to keep our psychological and emotional immune system stronger than the stress of the world around us that we experience. And we're surrounded by a lot of stress, and many people who are vegan or pro-vegan, moving towards veganism, don't even realize the amount of stress that we experience. It's crazy-making living in a world and being aware that we live in the midst of a global atrocity. And yet everybody around us is putting dead animals into their mouths as though nothing at all were wrong and thinking that something's wrong with us for even caring in the first place. It takes a tremendous psychological toll to be awake in this culture that's steeped in violence and unconsciousness. 
So I want to talk just briefly about why sustainable activism is so important. I mean, in some ways this may be obvious and in other ways perhaps less so. One reason is that it improves the effectiveness of activists and advocates and therefore of the movement. We are engines of the movement. If we are not taking care of ourselves, how, how many of you have seen vegans or activists who you feel are not taking care of their basic needs? And what happens? What do you notice about them? They become frustrated and misanthropic and exhausted, and they're just less effective ambassadors for the cause. Um, we're much more effective when we have sustainable lives, and therefore the movement itself is much more effective. In other words, the, the animals need us to take care of ourselves. And practicing sustainable activism reflects the core values of the movement. If we are advocating compassion and justice or fairness, and we're not practicing these values to ourselves, we're giving a mixed message. And that may not be so obvious or, or conscious, but it's a mixed message nonetheless. And we are animals too. And we deserve to be happy, and I know that's almost like a four-letter word among some activists, but I'm going to use it anyway. We need and deserve to be happy and fulfilled. And the more we can be sustainable, the more we can contribute to creating the world that we want to create. Now, I would suggest that sustainable activism is one of the most important components of effective activism. And it's also one of the most neglected. We live in a culture that teaches us to self-neglect in general. We live in a culture that celebrates workaholism and various types of addictions. So the broader culture itself tends to be self-neglecting and unsustainable. And the culture of veganism, and particularly of activist vegans, this microcosm of the macrocosm, is even more so. For many of us around our friends who are vegans or, or are activists, our default is to feel like we have to work harder, to feel like we're never doing enough. So we have a tendency to neglect this very basic, perhaps most essential aspect of our lives. So today I'm gonna to talk about four and a half steps to developing sustainable activism. And you'll understand what I mean by the half step when we get there. And then we'll talk about how to actualize this. So step one is to prioritize sustainability. Now, <laughs> let me ask you, before I talk about what prioritize means, have you ever been in a relationship with somebody who tells you you're a priority, but you know you're not? Why is it that you know you're not? What are they doing or not doing that gives you that indication? They think, yeah, they think you're a priority, but priorities are not just beliefs. They're beliefs that are acted upon. So when we prioritize sustainability, it doesn't mean we just put it to the top of our to-do list. We actually do it. We commit to doing it. So let's imagine you're saying now, yeah, sure, totally, I'm on board. I'm gonna prioritize sustainability, what do I do? Well, step two is to get informed. If you don't know how to be sustainable, we can't be sustainable. Most important is to learn about something called secondary traumatic stress and about your own experience of this. How many of you have heard of STS or secondary traumatic stress before? A few of you. So secondary traumatic stress is just like post-traumatic stress. You might have heard of PTSD, right? Post-traumatic stress disorder. The symptoms are all the same, but there's one key difference. Does anyone know what the difference is? You can just shout it out. Exactly, it, it, it doesn't affect the direct, the, the direct victims of violence, it affects the witnesses of violence. Okay, so many of us who become vegan have been witness and continue to witness some horrific violence toward animals. And then we're reminded of it every day. These traumatic triggers, reminders of the atrocity are, are virtually everywhere we turn. So I'm gonna talk more about secondary stress in a few minutes, but, but point one is to learn about it and to learn about your own experience of it. And the other 
thing that we need to do to get informed is to learn the tools to increase our resilience and reduce our stress. And that's exactly what we'll talk about today. I'll give you a couple of resources. Um, one is traumastewardship.com. There's a fabulous book called Trauma Stewardship, and it's all about secondary traumatic stress. It's a, it's a self-help book for people who want to recognize it in themselves and um, uh, take care of it in themselves. The other one is my new book, which I'll tell you a little bit more later. I have an entire chapter in that book specifically on the secondary traumatic stress that vegans and vegetarians experience. My new book is called Beyond Beliefs, A Guide to Improving Relationships and Communication for Vegans, Vegetarians, and Meat Eaters. But we don't need that, right, as vegans and vegetarians. No problem with communication or relationship. No, no stress in those fronts, right? Um, but I do have a chapter, and I'll talk more about the book. It covers a lot of what I'm talking about here, but I have a chapter that's specifically looking at secondary trauma and how that impacts us as vegans, vegetarians, and also in our relationships with others. Now, step three is to become aware of your needs. Unfortunately, in this culture, and in fact in most, maybe even all cultures today, need, like being needy, is, you know, it, it's an incredible put down. Need is looked at as something, you know, we, we pathologize people and ourselves for having needs. And this is really a shame. Because um, needs, having needs is normal, natural, and necessary. And when we can become aware of our needs and accept that we have needs, and that in fact, not only is there nothing wrong with having needs, but this is what makes us who we are. They're healthy, essential components of being a being, not just a human, but being a being on this planet. And when we become aware of our needs, we are in a much better position to attend to them. And that is the most important thing we can do if we want to create healthy lives, sustainable activism, and solid relationships. Now we have needs in various domains, right? We have physical or practical needs, like the need, I mean, this sounds obvious, but like the need for sleep. How many of you get enough sleep? I, <laughs> We have psychological needs, like the need to have fun, the need to be intellectually stimulated, the need to be entertained. We have emotional needs, the need to be witnessed, seen, attended to, able to talk about our feelings and listen to others' feelings. Social needs and spiritual needs, and spiritual is just anything that goes but beyond these other dimensions here. So, Basically, relationships, and I'm going to talk about how this relates to sustainability in a minute, but I want to talk about relationships for a minute. Relationships are all about needs. We're happy in relationships to the degree that our needs are being met. And we're unhappy in relationships to the degree that our, our needs are not being met. It's actually, I hate to oversimplify, but it is really that simple. Not that relationships are simple, but that formula actually is. What is the feeling that you have when you're in a relationship and your needs are not being met? What word would you give to that feeling? Huh? Resentful? Resentful? What else? Yeah, you feel deprived, right? You feel neglected. It is, by definition, actually neglect. So you can feel deprived, you can feel neglected. When we don't attend to our needs, we have the same feelings. We're just less aware of them or less aware of the source of them. We self-neglect. So step four is taking care of our needs, committing to practicing sustainability. We need to attend to, we need to see our needs as valid and as important and to attend to them every day. Don't wait that it takes so long, you know, that they've become a problem. It's sort of like depression. It's a lot easier to prevent a depression from setting in than it is to pull yourself out of the black hole once you've fallen into it. So attend to your needs every day. This means paying attention, looking internally. Are you feeling overstimulated? Have you been around people too much? Are you feeling resentful because you can't say no when you're asked to volunteer for things? You need to become self-aware to know what your needs are. 
You need to val value your needs so that you give yourself permission to see them in the first place. Often we don't see our needs because we feel ashamed of them, so we look away from them. And then we need to actually do what we need to do to take care of them. And ideally, get support. You know, surround yourself with people who give voice to that part of yourself that's committed to being healthy. Not people who feed the internal guilt that it's never enough or that you're not, not doing enough. And step five, um, I mean 4.5, is empower your organization. Not everybody here is a part of an organization, but if you are, empower your organization. And if you're not, you can actually change organization to relationship, empower your relationship. It's the same thing in terms of the way this is practiced. If you work at an organization, help create an organizational culture that's resilient, an organizational culture where the concept of sustainability is openly talked about. People know what it means. People are committed to supporting each other to doing what they need to do to not burn out and to be able to be in this movement for the long haul. Now, I'm going to um, actually give you a sustainability self-assessment to do. This is not a diagnostic tool. This is not meant to tell you that something's wrong with you or not. This is simply a list of questions for you to answer yes or no to, for you to get a sense of how sustainable your activism may be right now. So I'm going to give you a list of uh, symptoms of secondary traumatic stress. And what I'd like you to do is just think in your mind, there's no calculation at the end, this is just for your own awareness. Try to think about whether you have experienced these symptoms in the past month. And I'll read them out, I don't know if everybody can see the slides. So feeling helpless and hopeless, a sense that you can never do enough, whatever it is, it feels like there's always so much more. Uh, a tendency to minimize the suffering of others. Oh, he doesn't have it that bad compared to what's going on over here. Or maybe diminished empathy in some areas of your life. Difficulty listening, depression, sleep disturbances. This could be insomnia or hypersomnia, oversleeping. Um, seeing the wor world in, in, in what I refer to in my book uh, as... Um, the trauma narrative, where we, we start to see the world as one giant traumatic event and put people into specific roles, like rigid roles. So either somebody is a victim, and if they're not a victim, what are they? Perpetrator, or they're a hero. And the more traumatized we are, the more we have a tendency to do that. And we can see this a lot with vegans in the movement. You know, this is where you get into the kind of, you know, if somebody who's not 100% vegan 100% of the time is no longer perfect. So they're no longer in the role of hero. They then go into the role of perpetrator and we start treating them accordingly. Um, Avoiding and feeling overwhelmed by others, um, feeling uh, this feeling of disconnection from yourself and the world. Guilt. I know many, many vegans who have said that they feel guilty, they can't enjoy themselves, they just feel guilty for being alive. Some of you may have heard of survivor guilt. Do you know what that is? It's the guilt that people feel when they've survived a traumatic event and other people have perished. So like when people are in a boating accident or something, it's irrational, but it, it's normal, it happens. So some people die in a boating accident, other people survive, and the survivors feel guilty for, for, for surviving when others did not. This is also, in my observations, epidemic among vegans. I feel guilty, I'm not in a slaughterhouse, I'm not being vivisected, for example. Um, Self-neglect, seeing your own needs as unimportant. There's so much need in the world. Who am I to take care of myself? Um, sometimes chronic worry or anxiety, increased anger. How about a loss of faith in humanity? Just a little touch of that in this room, right? Right, this cynicism where suddenly the world is full of perpetrators in our minds. Um, black and white thinking. Um, feeling numb, feeling hypersensitive, feeling like a martyr. I'm always giving, giving, giving. I'm always the one to take care of everybody else. But when it comes to me, nobody's there. And sometimes um, workaholism. 
And I'll go through just a few more. This feeling of grandiosity, feeling better than, like it's my job, I can and should fix all the problems that come my way. You may have heard of intrusive thoughts, like thoughts that come into your mind of um, graphic animal suffering, images of graphic animal suffering, they just suddenly intrude in your mind when you're not expecting it. Does that make sense? Um, nightmares, this feeling of inability to let go of activism or advocacy. I've always got to be the vegan. Turn everybody around me vegan. Loss of enjoyment and maybe feeling incompetent. So, um, so I went through this fairly quickly. I often do this in a workshop setting, but this list is in, and, and actually an adapted list is in my book. Um, so if you want to see this again, you can, you can have it in that book. Um, but I'm just curious before we move on, looking through this checklist, um, is there anything you noticed in yourself? Were you thinking, oh wow, I've got a lot of those? Or like, everybody's going, yeah. Um, or maybe you were thinking like, wow, yeah, I'm pretty sustainable right now. Does anybody want to say any, share anything that you noticed when you were looking at this list? A lot of vegans and a lot of activists, they have actually fairly high levels of secondary trauma. And they'll say to me, they'll be like, but I thought this was normal. But I thought everybody felt this way. I mean, how could it ever be any different? I, I, I know what I know in the world. How could I know what I know in this world and not feel like this? Yes. Yeah, so that's a really great point, and I'll get to that in just a few minutes. But yeah, often like vegans come in and they're new in the movement and they're just like, oh, and they go on these vegan Facebook pages. How many of you have had this experience? And it's like, bam, bam, ba earthlings over and over again. You're right, and this um, ends up really working against us. So any other quick comments about what, or questions or what you noticed or wanted to ask? Yeah, that's a very, uh, very good observation, right? So some of you might relate to this, like you go through waves, like some periods in your life you have a lot of these checked off and others not so much. So this is where self-awareness is so important. It's really important to know why it starts to go up. You know, when there's added stressors, maybe an illness in the family, obviously it's gonna trigger some of these. But sometimes and often it's because we're not doing what we need to do to stay sustainable in the first place or to stay resilient in the first place. So I'll talk a little bit about secondary traumatic stress, which I refer to as an occupational hazard. I've worked with a number of animal organizations, and you could just see this organizations have staff, understandably, that are just playing out these roles and, and suffering tremendously from trauma. So STS I refer to as the silent killer of organizations. It eats away at groups and also at activists without anybody knowing what's going on. So they're not doing anything to attend to it. In fact, they're usually doing things that make it worse, like it becoming even more workaholic to try to offset their survivor guilt, for example. And STS is also contagious. The Renowned traumatologist, Dr. Judith Herman says trauma is contagious. When we're around traumatized people, we can start getting traumatized ourselves. One reason is because trauma is, it's, it's an emotion, it has a huge emotional component, and when we have empathy, we pick up on other people's feelings. You know, like if you're around somebody who's like really happy and not like creepy happy, I mean like just like happy, <laughs> you know, you get like a little bit higher yourself, a little bit happier. If you're around somebody who's in the midst of a soul-crushing depression, you probably feel a little heavier, right? When you're around somebody who's traumatized, you can pick up on that. But people who have trauma have a certain way of thinking, a very tiny bit of which I just explained, that drives their behaviors. And they relate to you in a certain way that can trigger a traumatic response in you. So they might treat you like a perpetrator. And then you, this vegans do this to each other all the time. 
Uh, one vegan will treat another vegan like they're a perpetrator because they didn't check all the ingredients in the sole of their vegan shoes that they just went out of their way to spend a ton of money on. There was a little bit of some glue that might have something in it. And the other vegan who already has so much survivor guilt starts to feel guilty and this feeds their secondary traumatic stress. See where I'm going with this? And the good news is that STS can be prevented reversed and it could end up helping us become even more effective once we work with it, once we recognize it. So I want to briefly talk about STS and needs. STS is both a cause and a consequence of self-neglect. Okay, the more we neglect ourselves, the higher our risk of STS is. And the more traumatized we are, the more likely we're going to be to neglect ourselves. So the moral of the story is be compassionate to, your, to yourself. We have a paradoxical relationship with the needs. Many of us who are vegan or are conscious, we're, we, we're so over-focused on the needs of the animals and the movement that we're under-focused on our own needs. So now in this last portion, I'm gonna talk about res resilience. Like what are some practical things that we can do to develop sustainable activism? This is a practice, okay? So I'm gonna give you some tips. You can, you can access this presentation online on our website, and I think Farm Sanctuary is making their own recording of it that will be available for you. The first point I wanna make is, um, as a woman over here rightly pointed out, witness carefully, meaning don't over witness. I cannot tell you how many vegans I've met who are like just destroyed because they watched some like horrible video again. And I'm like, why? Why are you doing that? They always say the same thing. Compared to what the animals go through, the least I can do for them is to watch two minutes of it. But the animals don't need a movement of walking trauma survivors. The animals need a movement of healthy, self-connected, grounded people who are able to be in this for the long haul. So, thank you. Give yourself permission not to witness. If you have to see that stuff for your job or something, then watch it. But other than that, protect yourself. Protect your boundaries. Don't make others unintentional witnesses either. Protect their boundaries too. So very often, you know, vegans will like use shock and awe tactics like, ah, gotcha. I throw earthlings in somebody's face when they're unexpected or post something on our wall for like non-vegans to see and other vegans end up seeing it. I mean, it's very important that we raise awareness about what's happening in the world. We need to make the invisible suffering visible, no question. But how we do this matters very much. And if we shock people with graphic imagery when they're not expecting it and they hadn't given consent, what role do you feel like they feel like they're in? They feel victimized by us. They, we don't know what that person's trauma history is either. We don't know what we're doing to them. They feel victimized by us. They say, oh my God. And then what role do they see us in? So that really works against us. We need them to recognize the real perpetrator, which is the industries that are doing this to animals in the first place. So the way we can do this, or one way we can do this, is to not shock people, but to get their consent. I'd like to show you something. This is why I'd like to show you something. Would you be willing to watch? Once somebody gives consent, they're giving, they're approving. Okay, they feel a sense of agency, they don't feel powerless, and they don't feel shocked. And if somebody starts doing it to you, and say, oh my God, you wouldn't believe what I saw on Facebook the other day, just ask them to please, please stop. I can't hear that right now. I know a lot of vegans who are, um, and just animal people in general, who are actually reluctant to stop watching. They're afraid that if they stop feeding their trauma, well, what do you think? You might feel it too. If we stop feeding it, what might happen? That's right, we're, we're afraid to let go of our anger and we're afraid to let go of our trauma because we're afraid if we don't feel this, this way, we're not gonna be part of the solution. But if we are motivated to change the world by trauma, then we bring trauma into the important work we're doing and it's less effective. Give yourself permission to let your trauma go. 
And then you come to your activism from a place of presence, from a place of self-connectedness, and you're much more likely to influence the people around you and to practice compassion toward yourself. Pause every day. Create space in your life every day to recharge your batteries, whatever that means to you. For some people, they need more stimulation. For some people, they need less stimulation, and it's going to change from you on a day-to-day -day basis. Pay attention to yourself during the day and ask yourself, am I getting drained? How does my energy feel emotionally, psychologically, physically? Am I getting drained? What do I need to do so that I can feel uh, feel like my batteries are charged today. Maybe you need to play a video game or go on a Netflix binge, or maybe you need to go for a run. It's very personal, but every day, give yourself the opportunity to create space, to do whatever you need to do to feel better, to feel sustainable. So if we are, self-awareness is critical because we can't know what we need if we're not paying attention to our thoughts and our feelings. So we really need to tune in. You know, think of thoughts and feelings as like, and especially feelings, think of them as like little children. And they're, they're like talking to you, they're whispering, they want your attention, but you don't give them your attention. So they get a little louder and you don't give them your attention. Then they start screaming and you still don't give them your attention. And then they start breaking shit. And then they get your attention. And then you've got the broken glass all over the floor to clean up. So pay attention. We can't, be att we can't pay attention to ourselves internally if we don't create space to do this. It's like, it's like trying to hear a bird song out the window when you've got the TV and radio on and you're talking on the phone. We've got to slow down and we have to make a priority stopping and creating space inside of us, ourselves. And I'm just going to give you um, just some food for thought. I'd like you to try to think of one thing that you could do that's practical, that you actually could do, that you're not doing now to take care of a need that you have that would make a tremendous positive difference in your life. Most of us know this. And try, there's actually an app. It's a gratitude app. I don't know if you've heard of it. It's called the Five Minute Journal. And it's a free app, and it actually prods you to think about like taking care of yourself and also to think about gratitude every day. And it's, it can be very, very helpful. We also need to learn effective communication with others, but also with ourselves. Most of us communicate with ourselves in a way that we would never tolerate from anybody else. And there have been plenty of studies done that have shown that our self-talk matters. It matters very much. It affects our mood. It affects our ability to succeed at, at, at what we care about. It affects many things. So there's a great book, if you want to read a lot, about this um, called Feeling Good, The New Mood Therapy. And um, it's all about uh, recognizing your internal dialogue. And I have a little bit of this information also in my, um, in my new book. One of the most important tips I'm gonna mention today is to try to avoid perfectionism. But there's no problem with perfectionism in this room, right? <laughs> Nobody in this room. Perfectionism is a major obstacle to sustainability. Perfect, when we are a perfectionist, what we're a perfectionist about doesn't actually matter. People are perfectionistic, like it, it's about a way of relating to the world and yourself. Our goals are just an excuse to have something to be perfectionistic about. Perfectionism keeps us out of the moment. It makes us constantly focused on future goals and regretting past things that we've done. If you give yourself permission, permission to be the messy, complicated, messed up human being that you are, because we all are, you give yourself and the people in your life that you're in relationship with a great gift. We're all messed up. We just have learned to play the game of let's pretend in this crazy world we've been born into so that we move through the world acting like we feel like we're so much more together than we really are. 
I've had the privilege of talking to so many thousands of people over the years and of learning that like there isn't a single individual that's not kind of screwed up in the head in some way. It's just a question of what kind of screwed up you've got. And truly, it is our messed upness. It's our messy parts. It's our imperfection. That, that's where our beauty is. That's what makes us beautiful. That's what makes us most attractive. Most people don't want to be around shiny, happy people. They want to be around authentic people. Give yourself permission not to be perfect, and this will take a tremendous burden off your shoulders. Now, healthy relationships are central to helping us become more resilient, and this is one of the reasons I wrote my new book on relationships and communication. Studies have shown that people who have fulfilling, connected relationships fare better in every aspect of life, pretty much. They live longer, they're, at, they're healthier at reduced risk for heart disease and certain types of cancers, they're happier, they're less likely to develop depression, anxiety, and other problems. They even have greater career success. Healthy relationships are so important, and unfortunately, one thing that often happens when people become vegan is they find that their relationships start to break down. They find, can you guys relate to this? They find that connection becomes problematic, if not impossible. And so I actually believe, after having talked with so many people, I'm also a relationship coach, so this is part of what I, I have done for our job, that, that the disruption in relationships is siphoning off a tremendous amount of energy from the vegan movement. Like imagine if all of us had healthy, connected relationships and we weren't so exhausted from trying to say the same thing 30 different times, 30 different ways and still being misunderstood. So I wrote my book, Beyond Beliefs. We have this here, which addresses um, all of the aspects of relationships and communication that I felt were most important to address for vegans. And one of the things I'd like to suggest, this is for vegans and for vegetarians and also for non-vegans, um, sometimes called meat eaters. It's a book that you can also give to people in your life who are not vegan or vegetarian to help them understand you and your experience. Um, learn effective communication. It's a cornerstone of healthy relationships. My book, I have a chapter specifically devoted to effective communication, and I focus on communication between vegans, vegetarians, and, and non-vegans. If you want more information, there's a great book here called Messages, the Communication Skills Book. It's a big book, goes over everything, but it's really quite brilliant. Um, so, studies have shown that um, practicing gratitude, I, I, it's interesting, but there have been a lot of studies on gratitude, and studies have shown that it actually helps people to become more resilient and happier. Um, there's a book I'm going to recommend that talks a lot about gratitude and other um, uh, tools for becoming happier. She uses the term happier. I would suggest more fulfilled is probably more accurate. It's called The How of Happiness. I don't know how to pronounce the author's name and I'm not even going to try, but I think it's the only book in the world called The How of Happiness. So one of the things that drains us as vegans and vegetarians is that we feel like we're so aware of the urgency of our mission, of what's happening all the time, that we feel like we have to be constantly on. We don't want to miss an opportunity to turn someone vegan. Can you guys relate to that? Just a little bit? It's exhausting. It's completely exhausting. It's important to give yourself permission not to advocate. Because what's more important than you getting that person to be receptive to veganism is you being vegan and in the movement for the rest of your life, for the long haul. So pay attention to yourself. When it feels like too much, maybe you want to go to that dinner party and not be the vegan for once. Give yourself permission not to advocate. Um, I mentioned a bit earlier that living in a dominant, carnistic, you know, animal eating culture takes a psychological toll on us. I have an article about this, if you go to veganadvocacy.org, that can help put some words to the experience. I also cover this um, in depth in my new book. 
But it's, the more you understand the way that carnism, this dominant meat-eating culture, conditions not only non-vegans, but also vegans to look at the world in a certain way that is really against our interests, the more we can create space between ourselves and these crazy stories that we learn. For example, the dominant culture, how many of you have heard this, teaches us to believe that we're overly sensitive. We're animal-loving sentimentalists. Have you heard this before? You're just an animal lover. So first of all, this, um, this stereotype that people who are trying to change the world for the better are overly emotional has been used to discredit proponents of pretty much all social justice movements. If somebody's too emotional, that means they're not what? They're not rational. If you're not rational, well, then your message isn't valid. It's a form of shooting the messenger. I would suggest rather um, than buy into this to recognize that our emotions of sadness and grief at the atrocity that is carnism are actually normal, healthy, and appropriate. And that what the world needs is more emotion, not less, when it comes to eating animals. So the, thank you. The more we learn about the dominant culture and the way it distorts perceptions, the less likely we'll be hijacked by these and the more grounded we can feel in our own choices and the better we can articulate them. And a final tip is to practice mindfulness. Mindfulness is basically, um, it's often, often practiced through meditation, although it doesn't have to be. When we practice mindfulness, what we're doing is we're learning to be more present or more in the moment. Now, there are many people who are far wiser than I am who have advocated across centuries that mindfulness or presence presence, being here and now, is the single most important thing any one of us can do for our own lives or to change the world. Because on the deepest level of what we're trying to do, it's not changing behaviors, it's shifting consciousness. On the deepest level, we're trying to change the consciousness of the world. And when we practice mindfulness, that changes our own consciousness so that we become more compassionate, more expansive, more spacious, more whole ourselves. It's also a proven technique to help develop resilience, or sometimes it's said, called resiliency. Um, I recommend, has anybody here heard of Headspace? A few of you? It's an app that um, I actually use, and my husband, who has the fastest mind of anybody I've ever met, um, uses. It's for people who don't really know how to meditate yet, although it's, it's got some advanced ones too. And it's a, it's a meditation app, and you could do even 10 minutes a day makes a difference. And finally, if you work in an organization, help cultivate a resilient organization. So if you think about it, the dominant carnistic culture, it causes us to feel unappreciated. You know, we're always like running around picking up the pieces of the mess left behind by others and our efforts are invisible at best and often even ridiculed. We feel like our efforts are never enough. We feel demoralized. We feel ashamed of our feelings. And so resilient organizations counter this. They express appreciation. Somebody does their job, say thank you, even if it's just doing their job. They celebrate successes. You don't just go on from one campaign to the next to the next. You stop and acknowledge that you've succeeded. Discourage overworking. Cultivate inspiration and, and validate emotions and concerns. Look at needs and emotions as not something pathological, but something normal and natural and healthy and create space in your life and in your organization for them. So I'm going to wrap up with a quote that I think sums up nicely um, the idea of sustainable activism. Don't ask yourself only what the world needs. Ask yourself what makes you come alive. And then go do that, because the world needs people who have come alive. So thank you all for being a part of the solution and for fighting the good fight and doing what you do and really making the world a better place for animals. It's because of you that the tides are starting to shift. The tide is starting to shift. So thank you all so much. Thank you.